On June 30, 2017, General Secretary Xi Jinping attended a grand gala at the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center to mark the 20th anniversary of the Special Administrative Region's return to China. As the grand event proceeded, a sequence of episodes from the territory's history was shown on the auditorium's big screen. Sojitsukan Shenzhen River is the boundary between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. After losing the Opium Wars, the humiliated Qing government was forced to cede territories and pay compensation to the UK. It was then that Hong Kong became separated from its motherland, with merely a river in between. The reunification of China had always been the unswerving goal of the Communist Party of China and the whole Chinese people. On the issues of the foreign colonies of Hong Kong and Macau, the CPC Central Committee adopted a plan for the long-term and usefully policy for the best interests of China. While abiding by the status quo, the Chinese mainland never ignored Hong Kong and the needs of its people. In 1963, Hong Kong suffered from an acute water shortage Reserves dropped to a level where they would be completely used up in 40 days. The CPC Central Committee immediately decided to divert water from Guangdong's Dongjiang River to save its fellow countrymen in Hong Kong. About 90% of Hong Kong's fresh food, 80% of its fresh water, and 25% of its electricity and natural gas are supplied by the Chinese mainland. Without critical and long-term support from the mainland, Hong Kong would not be as prosperous as it is today. In 1974, when Mao Zedong was discussing the Hong Kong issue with visiting British Prime Minister Edward Heath, he pointed to Deng Xiaoping and other top CPC leaders and said it was going to be the next administration's job to solve the Hong Kong problem. Taking over the mission of reunifying China, Deng Xiaoping put forward his original concept 
of one country, two systems, based on China's reality, providing excellent guidance and new possibilities for the country's peaceful reunification. On September 22, 1982, Margaret Thatcher visited China to negotiate the future of Hong Kong. The British Prime Minister initially pushed for continued British rule over its colony after 1997. <laughs> As a reply to Margaret Thatcher's argument that continuing British administration of Hong Kong was necessary for the stability and prosperity of the territory, Deng Xiaoping said, after rounds of negotiation, it was accepted that China would regain sovereignty over Hong Kong. A solution on how it would do so was determined in line with the wishes of the Chinese people. After two years and a total of 22 rounds of hard negotiations, the Chinese and British governments formally signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration on the question of Hong Kong on December the 19th, 1984, stating that China would resume sovereignty over Hong Kong on July the 1st, 1997. And according to Article 31 of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, Hong Kong would exist as a special administrative region directly under the Central People's Government, but enjoying a high degree of autonomy. In April 1990, the third session of the 7th National People's Congress deliberated and adopted the basic law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China, laying the legal foundation for the administration of the SAR. But after the Soviet Union fell apart and communist rule ended in Eastern Europe in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the British government misjudged the situation. It began setting up a series of obstacles to the handover of Hong Kong in violation of the joint declaration. Faced with the obstacles laid by the UK, the third generation of CPC central leadership, with Jiang Zemin at its core, braced themselves for the historical responsibility of realizing Hong Kong's smooth return to the motherland. Jiang Zemin clearly stated that the Chinese nation would never yield to external pressure. In October 1989, the British administration in Hong Kong unilaterally announced the construction of a new airport without any prior consultations with China. With a budget of over 200 billion Hong Kong dollars, the project was to span beyond 1997, which meant heavy debts would fall on the future SAR government. China argued vigorously so that the well-being and interests of the people of Hong Kong after the handover would be guaranteed. Another problem then arose. In 1992, the newly appointed governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, announced a plan to change Hong Kong's hitherto executive-dominated political system, increasing the difficulty of governing the territory after its return to China. And because of the example, of decency and 
完全变相的自选。目的在于什么呢？目的在于在九七年之后啊，通过立法局继续操纵香港的政政局啊，给他提供便利。Patton's reform proposals were against the joint declaration and the principle of the basic law. They violated the previous agreement and understanding between China and the UK, and were therefore strongly opposed by China. With the British acting unilaterally, Sino-British negotiations on Hong Kong's future political system eventually broke down. The CPC Central Committee decided to draw up its own contingency plan. We cannot achieve Hong Kong peace without cooperation. On July 16th, 1993. The Preliminary Working Commission of the Preparatory Committee of the Hong Kong SAR was formed in Beijing. On January the 26th, 1996, the Preparatory Committee for the Hong Kong SAR was formally established in Beijing's Great Hall of the People. In accordance with the principle of Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong, 94 members of the Preparatory Committee were Hong Kong citizens, accounting for 63% of the organization. In November 1996, the Election Committee for the First Government of the HKSAR was formed. On December the 11th, 1996, the Election Committee elected Tung Chi Hua as the first Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Jiang Zemin met with Tung Chi Hua in Zhongnanhai, Beijing. He was delighted to sit down with the man who would be Hong Kong's first Chinese administrator in more than 100 years. Tung was the symbol of a new era in which the citizens of the city would finally be governing themselves. At about 5 p.m. on June the 30th, 1997, the plane of the Chinese government delegation landed at Hong Kong's Kai Tak Airport. Jiang Zemin alighted. It was the first time a top Chinese leader had set foot in the territory in the 156 years since it was ceded to the UK. On the same day, the Hong Kong garrison of the People's Liberation Army. Officially entered Hong Kong on the order of Jiang Zemin. Rain fell on this day. As if it were washing away China's century of humiliation, Hong Kong, the territory that was lost for 156 years, was home again. Happy, happy, happy! We're Chinese, we're Chinese. 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 As the clock struck to mark the first minute of July the first, the Chinese anthem played and China's national flag was raised alongside the regional flag of the Hong Kong SAR.
After over a hundred years of foreign rule, Hong Kong had returned to where it belongs. It was an important step towards the complete reunification of China and a great achievement in Chinese history. Hong Kong citizens have since become the true masters of their own home city. From the moment of its return, Hong Kong started to implement the One Country, Two Systems Agreement, granting it a high degree of autonomy. The destiny of Hong Kong has since been more closely connected with that of the motherland. From the financial crisis that swept across Asia in 1998 to the global financial crisis of 2008, whenever Hong Kong has been in need, the central government of China has been prompt to give help. One after another, a raft of policies have been introduced to help Hong Kong overcome adversity and remain a stable and prosperous society. While Hong Kong was returning home, another child of China was getting ready to do the same. Macau was gradually occupied by Portugal from the mid-16th century. In June 1986, the Chinese and Portuguese governments began negotiations on the territory's future. On April 13, 1987, the joint statement on the question of Macau was formally signed returning sovereignty over Macau to China on December the 20th, 1999. Jiang Qi, Sheng Qi Yisi, Xian Zai Kai Shi. The successful return of Macau was another milestone on the road to Chinese reunification. On the day of its return, not many had expected that Macau, which had had negative economic growth for four consecutive years and a serious problem with public security, would soon become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. While celebrating the return of Macau, it was hard for the Chinese communists to not think of the last separated piece of the motherland across the Taiwan Straits. Since the Kuomintang's retreat to Taiwan in 1949, tensions between the mainland and the island province have persisted. 
In the early 1980s, Deng Xiaoping's concept of one country, two systems created possibilities for the development of cross-straits relations. In 1987, in response to internal pressure, the Taiwan authorities lifted a ban on residents of the island province visiting relatives in the mainland. After 38 years of separation, family members were finally reunited. In 1990, the Taiwan authorities approved the establishment of the Straits Exchange Foundation. At the end of 1991, the mainland government established the Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Straits. In March 1992, the two cross-straits organizations entered negotiations and reached the 1992 consensus. This stated that both sides would uphold the One China principle and work together to seek national reunification. So today we can say that the content of the two agreements is a mutual recognition of the text. It is not to express anything else. On April the 27th, 1993, a landmark meeting between Wang Daohan, President of the Association of Relations Across the Taiwan Straits, and Ku Chun Fu, President of the Straits Exchange Foundation, was held in Singapore. So On October 14, 1998, Ku Chun Fu led the Straits Exchange Foundation delegation to visit the mainland. Then Wang Daohan and Ku Chun Fu met again at the Peace Hotel in Shanghai. The meeting had been delayed three years because of interference from separatists in Taiwan. <laughs> Though separated by mountains and rivers, we enjoy the same winds and rains. Taiwan is an inalienable part of China, and reunification is unstoppable. On January the 30th, 1995, Jiang Zemin delivered a speech entitled Continue to Promote the Reunification of the Motherland. He put forward eight points for developing cross-straits relations and advancing the peaceful reunification of China. On March the 4th, 2005, the next president of China, Hu Jintao, put forth a four-point guideline on cross-straits relations under new circumstances. At the subsequent third session of the 10th National People's Congress, the anti-secession law was overwhelmingly adopted. On April the 28th, 2005, Hu Jintao and the then KMT chairman Lian Chan met in Beijing. It was the first meeting between top leaders of the Communist Party of China and the Kuomintang in 60 years. On November the 7th, 2015, Xi Jinping and Ma Yingzhou met in Singapore. It was the first time the paramount leaders of both sides had met since 1949, marking the beginning of direct dialogue and communication between the two sides. On the 40th anniversary of the issuing of Message to Compatriots in Taiwan, Xi Jinping systematically expanded a policy for advancing the process of the peaceful reunification of China in the new era, as well as a vision for realizing the Chinese dream through the efforts of the whole Chinese nation. 
。历史不能选择，现在可以把握，未来可以开创。新时代是中华民族大发展、大作为的时代，也是两岸同胞大发展。大作为的时代，前进道路上不可能一帆风顺，但只要我们和中共济，共同奋斗，就一定能够共创中华民族伟大复兴、美好未来，就一定能够完成祖国统一大业。征途。